Bible. Now, what I found, of course, is that the interpretation of angels as winged beings is really nothing that we find a reference to in the Bible. Angels are not described as winged in the Bible. This is kind of a later on, this is an interpretation that developed as artists in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance began to, like Da Vinci began to paint angels and they felt that, you know, the wings, I guess, were symbolic, you know, of the uplifting of the spirit, you know, the fact that they were, you know, uh, essentially ambassadors, uh, you know, of God or a higher power. Um, however, there is one famous story, of course, in the Bible of Ezekiel. Uh, the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament uh, claimed that this giant craft came down from the heavens that was known as the Merkabah and that four beings known as the Chayot or Chayot emerged from this craft. And in the Bible, he describes them as having four wings, each of them having four wings, and each of them having four faces, the faces, face of an ox, of a lion, of an eagle, and of a man. Uh, and again, many uh, proponents of the ancient alien uh, you know, theory, you know, that humans are somehow connected to extra extraterrestrials, and this is explained in, in ancient writings, in the, like the Bible. Um, would point to that. Um, now the harpies, of course, are, are probably the most well-known uh, flying humanoids in mythology and from Greek mythology. And uh, the word harpy comes from Greek harpii, which means to snatch or grab. And uh, the harpies are, uh, they make an appearance in some of the, make a, multiple appearances in some of the great works of literature, like uh, the Aeneid, uh, the Odyssey, uh, Dante's Inferno and so forth. And harpies are generally described or believed to be, um, you know, a, a bird-like form with the head of a hideous pale-faced hag or woman with long flowing hair and human-like breasts. And it was also uh, written that they were uh, essentially very foul-smelling creatures and that they would come down and snatch the food off of uh, the tables of nobility and, and kings and things like that, and that they would leave this horrible stench behind. The very, very swarthy creatures. Um, in Russian folklore, we can find the Alkanost, and the, in contrast to the harpy, the Alkanost is described as a beautiful woman, at least from the, uh, the bust up, beautiful face, long flowing hair, and the body of a bird. Uh, very similar to the, uh, the siren in Greek mythology. And I think there's some confusion or ambiguity there between harpies and sirens. Sirens are more like mermaids, I think. But the thing about the Alkanost is that it is said that she has this beautiful wailing song and that anyone that hears that song is basically uh, becomes her prisoner, uh, her prey, forget all that they know, that kind of thing. Okay, so. Many, many examples, and in fact, I, uh, there's an appendix in my book where I discuss many, many examples from different mythologies and folklores around the world of these beliefs in these sort of winged humanoid-like creatures. So this is just, I kind of just condensed that to, to run over a few of those because uh, I really want to get into the modern sightings and modern accounts. But I just wanted to kind of lay a foundation there in terms of, you know, that uh, the fact that these humanoid, these winged humanoid creatures or flying humanoid creatures, whatever they are, Obviously, they've been with us, at least in a cultural sense, they've been with us for thousands of years, right? Centuries, thousands of years, because they keep popping up in all of these different mythologies from very uh, disparate cultures all over the world. So, here's one that has a slightly more modern um, take. This is known as the Papa Bawa. And the Papa Bawa is an African Batman type of creature. And what's interesting about the Papa Bawa, and the, this is kind of a, a, a sketch that a uh, friend did for me, it's kind of described as kind of a flying monkey or a flying primate, leathery wings, forked tail, kind of ravenous and, and evil there. The Papa Bawa is believed to exist uh, off the coast of Africa on a small island known as Pemba. And as recently as the 1990s, there was actually a rash of Papa Bawa sightings or encounters that were reported on this African Isle of Pemba that actually resulted in mass hysteria. And that spread to the mainland of Africa to the nation of Tanzania. So just kind of an illustration there that oftentimes these folklore creatures 
uh, do sort of pop up or appear in modern uh, scenarios. And uh, this is Dr. Carl Schuker. This is Dr. Carl Schuker. Not this one. <laughs> Dr. Carl Schuker is, you know, one of the preeminent cryptozoologists in the world. He's uh, uh, he lives in England and he writes for um, Forty and Times magazine. If any of you read Dr. Schuker's Zoo Crypto Zoo, that's kind of his article. But I asked Dr. Schuker to write the foreword to my book because. He'd actually written about different flying humanoids in some of his other books. He's got a number of books out there. And uh, I could tell he shared a keen interest in these creatures. Um, and I, of course, I was quite honored that he did write the foreword to the book. Now, he's holding a little figurine here that I believe is from that movie Van Helsing. Um, but uh, Dr. Schuker does write about one of the creatures he writes about is known as the Orang Bati, which is uh, from the island of uh, Java. And Orang Bati, actually, the literal translation is man bat. <clears throat> Those of you that are connecting the dots out there, orangutan, which is from the same region, of course, means orang means man. And atan means from the trees. So Orang Bati means man bat. And so again, uh, the descriptions are basically a hybrid or a cross between human-like and bat-like characteristics, leathery wings. The Orang Bati is, again, greatly feared by the local Moluccan people on the island of Java because it apparently swoops down uh, from a, a great volcano at night and snatches small children and women and, and takes them off to their death. So, <clears throat> OK, now getting into a little bit more of a modern context, I wanted to really broaden the scope of the book. So I mean, there, there, there was certainly a wealth of material with regard to traditional flying humanoids. Um, but I just thought it would be fun to kind of explore some of the other uh, sort of uh, inexplicable figures that we can find in Fortean literature. And so I write about this. Oh, keep doing that, sorry. This is Spring Hill Jack. I mean, you ever heard of Spring Hill Jack? It's actually a great story. It's uh, Spring Hill Jack is sort of a combination between uh, an urban legend and a supervillain, I guess. Uh, but there was a gentleman that got in touch with me named Jonathan Lackey. And I've interviewed him several times over the phone uh, at length. And he's, his story has remained very consistent. And he really strikes me as a very credible person. And he, in fact, he told me initially, he said, Ken, you know, I used to not want to tell people about this. But you know, I've gotten a lot older now. And I've just gotten to a point in my life where I just don't really care what people think. Because I know what I saw. And this is what happened. And what Jonathan told me is that when he was a young man, he and a friend were kind of driving on a remote road uh, outside of Yardley, Pennsylvania, which is just across the river from um, the Delaware River from New Jersey. And they had just bought this fancy spotlight that they had installed in their car. So they were kind of driving around on these remote roads and spotlighting animals and things. And at one point, as they came over a hill, they could see this animal walking across the road in front of them. And so they shone the spotlight on it. And what he described to me was, he said it was about the size of a Doberman Pinscher dog. But it had four legs, and it had these bat-like wings. And he said it also had a long prehensile tail and a face that looked kind of like a monkey. It was kind of a shiny black face. And it looked like it was wet, like it had just come out of the river. And it actually, they got a good look at it because it kind of paused on the roadway. And then it scurried off uh, into the woods. And uh, Jonathan has actually drawn some, some uh, sketches of this creature. And I've got one of them included in my book. So. <clears throat> I had to admit to, to him, I said, you know, I've, I've never really believed that there was really anything to the Jersey Devil. But if what you say is true, what you're describing to me actually probably fits the profile of the Jersey Devil or what people claim to have seen better than anything else I can ever think of. So pretty creepy stuff. Um, I have a, a chapter in the book uh, titled Flying Saucer Invaders. And the reason I included that particular chapter is that I found through the course of my research that there were actually there was a lot of crossover, I found, between things like Mothman and UFOs, ufology, and so forth. And there are actually many accounts that uh, took place during the 1950s. And I, I imagine many of you here are probably familiar with you know, the history of ufology and how that whole thing developed. Uh, but since Kenneth Arnold's famous sighting in 1947, where the phrase flying saucer was coined, Throughout the course of the 1950s and during the Cold War, there were several incidents around the country that involved 
virtual flying saucers have landed scenarios. And uh, some of those included sort of uh, what, uh, what I would describe as gravity-free beings that emerged from these different crafts. Uh, one of the most famous cases, gosh, I can't believe I keep doing that. OK. One of the most famous cases involves the Flatwoods Monster. And the Flatwoods Monster, uh, this, is, uh, this occurred in Flatwoods, West Virginia, which is actually not too terribly far from where the Mothman resides. But um, in uh, September of 1952, in this remote area of West Virginia known as Flatwoods, there were several young boys out playing football uh, when suddenly they looked up and saw this giant reddish orange ball of fire flying through the sky above their heads. And it was moving kind of slow, or well, they thought it did. And it seemed to land on the top of this giant hill at the edge of town. So, you know, this was, of course, at, the, at that time period when flying saucer movies were out and it was kind of in the public consciousness. So they thought, well, maybe this is a flying saucer or maybe it's just a meteor, but let's go investigate this. So the boys got all excited and they charged up this, this hill to go see what this thing was that had landed. Along the way, they actually uh, were joined by two adults, a woman named Kathleen May and a young man named Eugene Lemon, who had just enrolled in the ar enlisted in the Army, and he brought his dog along. So by the time they got to the top of the hill, there were two adults and five, child five of these young boys. And as they neared the top of the hill, they could smell this weird kind of static smell. And suddenly, they, they looked up and they saw what they perceived to be two red glowing eyes looking down at them from high up in this tree. And as Kathleen and Eugene showed their flashlights up, they were kind of leading the pack, Suddenly, this figure, according to them, took life. And they described it as a basically a somewhat of a humanoid form, but it was about 9 or 10 feet tall, and it was floating off the ground about 1 or 2 feet. And they basically said that this thing lit up like a Christmas tree, and it started moving towards them and sputtering an oily substance and making all kinds of weird mechanical noises. Um, they described its head as looking like the, uh, the ace of spades kind of shape. Its eyes like like two giant glass portals, and it had kind of a. Th this is kind of an artist's interpretation that I've I've since learned is not that accurate. But basically, it had kind of a cone-shaped, like an ice cream cone-shaped body, and two antenna t sticking out of its side, which were later kind of depicted as being arms. So of course they were terrified, and they all charged down the hill to get away from this thing. And by the time they got down to their house, or the house of Kathleen May, they were all violently ill and, and vomiting. And the dog that had come with them was vomiting. And in fact, it died a couple of days later of mysterious causes. Well, this is a very famous case uh, in the annals of ufology. And in fact, it was important enough to the US Army that they were out that night investigating and looking for this particular thing. So um, very famous case, the Flatwoods Monster. Um, <laughs> There's an excellent book known as The Beast of Braxton County by a gentleman named Frank Fraschino, uh, who's really, really investigated this case in depth. Um, he believes, and most people now believe, that whatever the Flatwoods monster was, it was not flesh and blood. It was mechanical, some type of robotic creature, or maybe, if you believe in extraterrestrial, maybe an extraterrestrial wearing a, uh, some type of contraption. Um, Nick, Nick Redfern has actually pointed out to me, and I read about this in the book, that throughout the years, different military uh, entities have experimented with um, basically giant mechanical robotic scarecrows that are able to walk around. And you know, the whole point of that being to see if they could basically you know, terrify people. You know? So they, they launched an experiment where they had this 12-foot robotic creature marching through a remote town just to see how people would react to that, you know. So they're, they're, that's where your tax dollar is going, just so you know. <laughs> um, OK, and then on the right here, we have the Kelly Hopkinsville Goblins. This is another famous case from 1955. In, um, in, uh, in 1955, there was a family uh, that lived in a remote area. Why, why are these always remote areas, right? <laughs> I guess people are bored, I don't know. Um, in 1955, this family that lived in uh, a small hamlet of Kelly, Kentucky, near the town of Hopkinsville, claimed that they looked up one night, or one of them looked up one night and saw this, similar to the uh, Flatwoods case, saw this thing coming down from the sky and it landed you know, on the edge of their property. And a short time later, 
they described these little goblin-like creatures that were scurrying around their property. Uh, silvery metallic color to their skin, giant bug, bugged out eyes, big weird looking ears. Um, they were described as having like, they were very small, about three feet tall. Um, they were described as having these big muscular upper bodies but kind of weak withered legs and they kind of moved with a weird shuffling gait. But what was weird about these creatures is that, <laughs> and I kind of joke in my book that, you know, as you might expect in the remote mountains of Kentucky,